how are uh, our condition and other people's conditions to predict outcomes. So this is the reason why we want to be able to identify things like that and factors, because we want to be able to predict their outcome and we want to prevent them. And of course, law is comparative. When we say something is genocide, when someone's engaged in genocide, it's inherently saying it's similar to the Holocaust, because the Convention for Genocide was invented in part in response to the Holocaust. And we are, in fact, legally obliged as signatories of the UN Convention to identify genocide and to prosecute it so that we can prevent it. So, and I would argue history is inherently comparable. When I say Hitler was a fascist dictator, the words fascist and the words dictator are comparative. We're saying they fit into a certain kind of category. Um, so, um, still, there are better and there are worse kinds of comparisons. So I tried to organize ways that there are people make mistakes as historians when they're making comparisons and ways that they could do it better. So first, um, uh, some ways that I think are poor comparisons. The first would be an inappropriate comparison, comparing apples to oranges, two things that don't really belong together. Um, if it's uninformed or inaccurate, obviously that would make for a bad comparison. If the comparison is glib or facile or trivial or otherwise poorly reasoned, those would also be identifiers of a poor comparison. We also want to avoid overstating or understating the case, right? There could be exaggeration in either direction, and that makes for bad comparisons. Two kind of more specific methodological issues would be if you only take evidence from one case, but use the other case kind of as a straw man. So you want to make sure that you have evidence from both of the cases to demonstrate the similarity. And that's where I can be of help because I can provide the jury case for you. Or if you only say things are similar or you only say things are different. Because in history, we're, we have an ideographic discipline. Everything's always a little bit different. Because <laughs> everything has uniqueness. So you want to make sure you keep those things clear. Um, in, in terms of our concepts, um, scholars criticize comparison when it's either too narrow or too broad. Too narrow would be nothing is like the Holocaust. To, to broad would be everything is like the Holocaust. Um, too general or too particular. This is a question of how much abstraction you use in your categories. So for instance, do we erase the unique events that are taking place in one place? Or do we only talk about those unique events and never generalize out of that one situation? And uh, I'm going to call, I'm going to suggest here that we want somewhere in between. Um, one of the most interesting things that came out of my research into how other scholars do this is a comment made by Nancy Green, who is a um, historian. And she warns for what she calls false nominalisms. So in history, we, we talk about this all the time. The word love, we use the word love and people use the word love 2000 years ago. Does that word mean the same thing in a different historical context? So what she's warning is, be careful of words like race, for instance, or like fascism, because in one situation, that word might have one set of meanings and in a different context, it might have slightly different meanings. And we need to keep those contexts very clear. The biggest danger I see in comparisons when I read newspapers about people evoking Hitler in contemporary debates is what's called reductio ad Hitler, right? Which is making everything about Hitler and reducing any problem to Hitler, uh, AKA the other word for this is playing the Nazi card, right? So an example of playing the Nazi card is um, Hitler was a vegetarian, so clearly vegetarianism is wrong, and we should all eat meat. And because I'm a vegetarian, I'm just going to mention that people have made this accusation to me, that I should not be a vegetarian because Hitler was a vegetarian. <laughs> as if, as if, just simply the association with this one person totally negates anything. Another major uh, principle of comparative history when you're dealing with trauma is that we should never be comparing suffering. 
So this comes from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. When we say this is a genocide, or this is fascist dictatorship, and this isn't, the purpose of that is not to say my people or my group suffered more than your people. That's not on the table. That's off the table. If we do that, forget it, then we're just in the realm of, of, of politics. Again. So all of people's suffering is bad. The point is for us to understand. So in other words, really the underlying message here, historical comparison can often be used purely for effect, for shock value. And so we want to avoid that. So what are some signs of good comparison, which I hope will inform the rest of our conversation? We should be comparing apples to apples. There should be, it should be an appropriate comparison. It should be factu factually accurate and well-informed. It should be robust, serious, relevant, substantive, well-reasoned, just like all scholarly debates. It should be empirically grounded and dispassionate. We should try to make sure we see evidence from both of the cases so that we can make an honest comparison rather than using one case as a straw man. Um, and to follow Marc Bloch, very famous French historian, um, we should be making comparisons of both similarities and differences because nothing is exactly the same and nothing is exactly the same. Um, in terms of our concepts, Peter Baldwin, uh, historic comparative historian, he calls for what he calls mid level empirical comparisons. Think of it as the Goldilocks point, neither too narrow nor too broad. And similarly, uh, Haupt and Koka, two very famous German comparative historians, they talk about moderate abstraction. We need our analytic concepts, but we should also recognize that there are contextual differences in each of the cases. So the United States is not Germany in the 1930s. There are going to be differences that are specific to our context, and yet we can use analytic concepts to compare them. In terms of purpose, remind us that history is inherently political, <laughs> but we have an ethical obligation to discredit fascism. Many of your grandparents, parents fought in World War II, sacrificed their lives, their homes, their families, in order to defeat fascism in the past, um, history should be used to discredit politics. That is going to lead to human violence. That's, that is the purpose, one of the rules of, of history. We say in, in Holocaust studies, we say never again. Well, never again requires clearly identifying what the problem is and preventing it. So we must, we, we, have, we have an obligation to do these comparisons. And as I said, we have a legal obligation to prosecute genocide when we do it. Um, but we need to do it with care. We need to do it with substance. We cannot compare suffering. We can't disrespect victims. Um, we need to clearly use our analytic terms to clearly and precisely figure out what happened so that we can prevent it from happening. Um, Philippa Levine, another comparative historian, she argues comparison is a heuristic device, a way of thinking that enables learning. Let me just put an, an aside here. There's another trend in history in the last 20 years. Um, looking at Pat here in the room, I think Pat probably was doing this long before anyone else did it, before it was a name, but, um, but that's besides the point. Um, it's called transnational history now. Transnational history is a little different from comparative history. It makes comparison. <laughs> but what it's really trying to do is show the connection between one historical case to another. So that's another thread that we could go down, has slightly different principles. But that's one of the ways in which old Nazis, the old the Nazis from the 1930s, are connected to the Nazis of the present. And that's a slightly different story. But we can certainly discuss that. And when you're dealing with German history and you're dealing with traumas like genocide, communism, and, uh, many different kinds of many kinds of different crises in the world, um, German history is filled with them. Showing those global connections is really quite important. Um, so, what's the payoff of what we're about to do? Where I'm going to turn the tables over to you in just a moment, and we're going to start making these comparisons. 
other historians, other scholars have, can do repeatable experiments, right? <laughs> if you're a biologist, if you're a dentist, if you're, you, can, you, can, you can say, let's test again. And let's do the drug a second time to see what happens. Historians don't really want to do that. We don't want to, well, let's start another genocide so we can see what, how it plays out. So all we have are those comparative cases to kind of replicate repeatable experiments. Um, and what, what comparability does for us is three things. And these are, again, I'm taking these concepts from Conan O'Connor and from, from Haupt and Cocker. Comparison denormalizes, defamiliarizes, and deprovincializes. What Cohen and O'Connor mean by denormalized is that history is often told in certain what we call meta narratives. There are certain storylines that we tell our national histories in. And we repeat those stories again and again. And when we then tell a specific story, we, we often frame it in terms of those big stories. An example of an American merit meta narrative is Manifest Destiny or um, in, uh, in the immigration story, right? Those are the ways we tell stories in American history, some of the ways. What, what Conan and O'Connor argue is that by comparing it to another case, you break with those narratives and you see maybe some of the more essential things that are going on. So it challenges you to think differently about your national history. Um, Haupt, Haupt and Kalka use this term defamiliarize or deprovincialize because it gets you to stop being so nationalistic in your own discourse. And you start realizing that there's this whole larger world out there where lots of other similar events are taking place. And it gives you a, a chance to rethink those stories. Uh, Baldwin, Peter Baldwin quoted John Stuart Mill who argued that comparison helps us to separate the important factors from the incidental ones. So uh, that's my set of guidelines to begin. <laughs> Um, those are just some principles to keep us on track um, in our conversations. But really, the main purpose here is for us to begin to think about what is going on in the world today and how uh, past experiences from German history might help us to understand what's happening in the world. And uh, past and today's world might help us to rethink some of the things that have happened in German history. So I assume before you got here, you did, hopefully you did a little thinking about this. So I'm willing to venture, uh, I, could, I could propose my own things or we could open the floor to other comments so we could think about this together. Have you in the last few years been thinking that there are things that are similar between the past, the German past and the present? Yeah. Comparing uh, January 6th to Crystal Night. Crystal Night, right. Okay, so, so let's try to do it according to the principles that we just did, right? So in the United States case, uh, we had a group of um, people who were protesting a, an election, claiming that the election was um, uh, accurately conducted, and they invaded and, um, a, a federal building, broke into it physically, threatened its, uh, the, the elected officials, and um, in order to prevent the execution of the, the, the conducting of the, the, the um, verification of the election by Congress, right? So the comparison you're proposing is to the Night of Broken Glass. Yeah. Um, so during the Night of Broken Glass, um, a, the story goes like this. A, um, the Nazis, um, that one of the first groups of Jews that they deported from Germany were Jews who had been living in Germany um, as, who were for actually technically Polish citizens. And they deported a whole bunch of them, and so tens of thousands of them. Poland did not want to accept them, so they were stuck on the border in a camp. And I'll just, we'll come back to that one in a moment, in a second also. And the conditions were so poor in this camp that one of the children of one of the families that got deported, he, had, he happened to have been living in Paris. He was so upset about this that he assassinated a lower minister in Paris, a German lower minister. And the Nazis used this attack by a Jew against Germans 
um, to, as justification for a series of uh, planned attacks against synagogues and shops across Germany. This was very carefully orchestrated, usually by stormtroopers from one town going into the next town so that they didn't have any personal relationships with their, um, with their, uh, with their neighbors. And they would then go into that other town and they would make like this was a popular uprising. So the term Reichskristallnacht is actually Nazi propaganda, many broken glass. It's the term the Nazis gave for it, for attacking the synagogues. In, and their, their claim was that this was popular hatred for the Jews finally expressing itself after this assassination. Um, what do you think of that comparison? I have problems. It's not the same. What you apples to oranges? Yes, it's apples to oranges. Why? Although there are some things that were pre-set apparently at the six of uh, January sixth yes. as well by groups and by instigation, we have direct evidence that the people that are doing it are the ones that are the drivers behind. And in the Kristallnacht, it was put on others. Uh, so the Nazis, in the case of, so we know on January 6th that it was planned. It was planned by group organized groups who were supporters of former President Trump. And he, and they, and they, they, they engaged in a public performative act, I would say that it's very similar, and, but it was not directed against individuals. It wasn't get directed against shops. That's where I would differ because it, it wasn't targeting. Unless they would have lynched uh, the vice president and the, killed a number of democratic uh, senators. I, I would agree, except the difference I would see is that those are elected officials. Yes. And that's different from attacking that's ordinary different. citizens. I would draw a distinction okay. between ordinary citizens. Okay. The analogy I would make would be to the White mm -hmm. Stack fire of, yes. of, of 1933. So in that situation, a Dutch communist, or we think he was a communist, supposedly. Um, I just thought I would recognize Jacob's, uh, Jacob's uh, heritage here. Um, so a, 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 he allegedly set fire to the Reichstag building, which is the congressional building. It is actually not clear. The research research is a little bit more hazy about whether it was set up by Nazis or not. It's really inconclusive. But we certainly know that the Nazis jumped on this as an opportunity to implement what were called the Enabling Acts. And the Enabling Acts effectively ended habeas corpus. So habeas corpus is the law dating back from medieval England that says that if you are seized by the king, you must be tried in a speedy way. You can't be held indefinitely. And this effectively um, gave police dictatorial powers to the regime because they could then incarcerate people and, and put them in concentration camps. And so the whole terror system gets created on the basis of this attack against the Congress vote. Um, it was followed by a new election. And um, when, when, excuse me, when the, go back again to the Enabling Acts. The crucial thing about the Enabling Acts is that it was not actually voted by a majority of the German um, uh, ministers of parliament. The Social Democratic ministers of parliament literally didn't show up. They said, we're not going to be there so that to stop a quorum so that the election cannot go forward because this is fundamentally anti-democratic. And instead, uh, Hermann Göring, who was the head of, um, of the right stack at that point in time, he said, well, they're not here, they're absent without leave. So we're gonna vote with them based on the quorum that's left, which if anyone knows parliamentary procedure, that's not parliamentary procedure, that's, that's cheating. So the bottom line was the Nazis came to power illegally. They broke the rules 
in order to twist the way the results of the election to give Hitler power. And in that way, I see a similarity between what was going on. The story is slightly different. The rules of the, of the American situation is slightly different. But were they trying to overturn the will of the people? Yes, clearly. And it just took a different path in the Nazi case. Other thoughts, other comparisons that you've seen in recent years. The other one that got that raised a lot of debate is whether or not the camps for um, for families on the border in Mexico are concentration camps or not. What are your thoughts on that? Are we getting any chats, by the way? Um, there was one chat from Ed. One event targeted the population, the January 6th target the government. See, Ed, Ed agreed with me, yes. <laughs> so how about concentration camps? Yes, Pat. Some years ago, there was a lecture by a uh, Japanese American soci sociologist talking about the World War II concentration camps and it happened to be given at a Jewish community center. And a lot of the people there were Jewish and one woman get up and said, well, how many people died in those camps? Right. And were there gas chambers? And this bears on your point that the, uh, uh, making a comparison and concentration camp is now accepted word for those relocation camps. Uh, make try to make a comparison less people get this extreme. Uh, so, so I, I just want to make sure everyone at home can hear what Pat said. So I'm going to repeat it. So he was identifying the fact that that um, during a recent, uh, a, a recent uh, lecture a few years ago, a scholar, a sociologist made comparisons between um, uh, Japanese, just Japanese I, I mean, camps. You know, he didn't make comparisons. He just used the term. Concentration you know? camps. Yeah. That's right, for the Japanese internment camps from World War II. And uh, a Jewish person who was in the audience got upset because it seemed that the convention she seemed to be claiming that the comparison was inappropriate because people didn't die there. So this is this is a great discussion because uh, most of the Japanese did not die who lived in concentration in the internment camps, but they did lose their property <laughs> and they lost their livelihoods and they were children were divorced from families in some cases um, and uh, they were humiliated and publicly shamed for being not Americans. So there were lots of consequences that came from it. It's not the same, but it's not entirely different. But here's the key point. The woman was making a mistake because she was comparing, she was treating all of the Nazi camps as one kind of thing. And in fact, scholars would be much more careful and we would distinguish between labor camps, concentration camps, and death camps. So- And transportation camps. Uh, uh, tra transfer, transfer camps, right? like Western Ward, Ward in, in the Netherlands, right? So let's define what each of those things are because they're radically different. And then there are even other things, there are ghettos and there are other forms. Okay, so uh, a, a labor camp was a camp where you were sent to in order to perform certain kinds of labor services. That actually was kind of similar to the Japanese camps. Many of the internment camps, the, the people worked and they worked in the communities in the neighborhoods where they lived, right? Um, that's, so that's one example. Another kind is a concentration camp, which certainly became deadly, but many of the concentration camps weren't initially deadly. They were violent, they were filled with terror, but only really towards the end of the war did they become places of mass death because of the large concentration of people without food and war. Yes. Or, no, I was or just the killing uh, ovens and things like that. Not in concentration camps. Concentration camps, there was a, there was a, there were there were oh. gas chambers in Dachau, but they were never used. So there was there. But that's not true for all. Okay. Right. That's right. So because those are concentration camps. And then there are the death camps. The death camps are a category, those are factories built to systematically murder people. No one would make a comparison between a death camp and what's going on on the border. It's not a death camp. Right. The question is whether it's a concentration camp. 
right? It's clearly not a labor camp. Would you agree with that? Because they're not doing labor. Right. But are they being held in one concentrated place? Yes. Are they prevented from leaving? Yes. Can they go back home? You could also call them a DV camp, right? So displaced persons as a category emerges after World War I. We never had displaced persons before because we didn't have passports in the 19th century. We didn't have as firm borders as we have today. That was a product of World War I. So all of a sudden, you have this new category of people as the empires of Europe all collapsed, the Eastern Europe, the Russian, the Ottomans, the Russian Hungarians. You have all these new nation states coming up. They all of a sudden draw their borders really firmly. And they say, you're not a citizen anymore because you're not my kind of people. And then they throw them out and they put them in a displaced persons camp. So that seems to me to be something that's quite similar to what's going on here because we're talking about a population that is neither wanted by Mexico nor are they wanted by the United States officially by the governments and they're stuck on the border in between. So again, here's an example where comparison can help us to really analyze what the situation is. Ah, yes. To get transnational for a moment, yeah. I think the real comparison is in all refugees worldwide who are growing you know, exponentially every right. year. That's right, that's right. And to see this as a long-term process and to, and to realize that when the countries are, in, when countries are engaged in deporting their own citizens and placing them on the border like this, they are learning from each other, right? When Hitler decided he was going to deport Jews, he had a vision for a world without Jews. He hadn't quite worked it out yet. But when he was imagining doing it in the 19, late 1930s, he looked back to the Armenians and he literally said, who thinks about the Armenians today? So let's just do that to our Jews. Okay. He also was thinking about the Native Americans in the United States. Yes, I, think, I think I need to put a couple of the questions, yes, the questions that came from our uh, Zoom audience. Um, Ed makes the comment about the migra uh, migrant camps were terrible holding cells, but concentration camps forced labor and consensusfully mur murdered people. The US Japanese internment camps are a better comparison as we, we came down. That's true. Uh, and then- and, Well, and so wait, wait, let's, let's just clarify what Ed's saying there. So again, cut. Depends on when you're talking, right? Concentration camps were murderous places right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. If you were a communist and you fell into the hands of the Nazis, you could end up dead very quickly. Um, and the Japanese were not systematically murdered. But that doesn't mean that they still didn't lose their homes and their families and their, their property and they were humiliated. So there are similarities there too. Um, and uh, and they were, most importantly, they were, they were categorized as non- as not disloyal Americans, which was something that was very hurtful for them. So there are similar, I think there's more similarities um, than, but certainly I would agree that they're in between. Yeah. Okay, and then there is a discussion even in, among the chat. Charles, and let me get both of the parts in first. Charles says, how about the recent issue in Missouri where the will of the people approved the Medica Medicaid expansion mm -hmm but the state legislature did not provide any funding. That seems like a clever, definitely clever way of bypassing the will of the people without actually confronting the issue. And Ed says, Charlie, it may be worse than that in those states whose legislatures are attempting to allow statewide votes to be overturned by a majority of the legislature, like the Arizona situation mm -hmm. at least. That's where the attempts go. And let's for, not forget about the Georgia debacle during the, the final months of last year as well. So you clearly have a political party actively seeking to undermine democratic elections. I got into a debate with a fellow German historian about this on Facebook, and I decided not to pursue it. He'll, he'll remain unnamed. He'll, he'll remain nameless. But he's actually a wonderful historian speaker. He said, this is actually not fascism. He said, this is, this is just not capital R Republican. This is Republicanism as opposed to democracy. He's drawing a distinction, in other words, between 
a system of elected government where the government is really ruled by a very small oligarchy. And that oligarchy really doesn't want to listen to the population. And democracy, which says that the populace, the people are sovereign. So he's saying these are just small R Republicans who believe that the small elite group who actually controls the United States through money and through politics, they just want to stay in power and they could care less what the, what the electorate does. So this is a this is a an elitism versus democracy. I countered that because of the way that this is attacking the rule of law and the basic principles under which the elections are decided, that it's creating dictatorship. And my fear in the state of Missouri to speak specifically to Medicaid, I was in my spare time, I'm very active in non a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, and we, were, uh, we collected signatures on the streets for um, Medicaid expansion. And so I was very committed to this issue. I think it's a really, it's a racial, it's a racial justice issue. It's a, it's a feminist issue. It's cut hits lots and lots of different places. Um, I think what's happened is that Missouri is becoming a test case for a, this strategy. And the strategy is to use power, state power, gerrymandered state power to create a one, a one party state for the next 10 or 20 years for the, for the next generation. Let me explain how I think it's working. The governor uh, is gonna tend to win a, is gonna tend to be a Republican because we have a slightly red or slightly pink, right? We're on a little bit on the red side. Um, but the, uh, the legislature should be much more evenly balanced. It's, we are one of the worst gerrymandered states in the country. And uh, there's actually, you can check this out on something called Fair Vote um, is the website. And they have mathematical principles to show how things are, are misrepresented. And the only way that we've been able to change this is through the ballot initiative process. Um, the ballot, that they're about to change the ballot initiative process Yep. which is going to make it much, much harder for the voters to change, to change. And it doesn't matter because the legislature is ignoring what the ballot is, even though we voted as a constitutional amendment, they are now rejecting. At an absolute fundamental level, the crucial thing is then redistricting, which is taking place right now. And this redistricting process, if left in the hands of the party that wants to create it's going to make even more uneven representation, and the result will be this will be a. Don't get me wrong, I'm I'm way blue, but I don't believe that this Missouri is a blue state. Missouri should be a purple state, the way it has has been for hundreds of years or decades. It's the making it a deep red state shows just how unrepresentative the system is. So I would agree with that. The 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 comment that um, this is about undermining the democracy. Here's a place where I would say they're being a lot more clever than the Nazis. And there was a gigantic debate among German historians about this right from the beginning of the Trump administration. Do, do we have to identify, do the current efforts to undermine democracy have to have stormtroopers walking down the street in order for you to say that it's a similar danger? That's the question. And there are some historians who absolutely say, no, you need to have the death counts, you need to have the stormtroopers in order to identify this as an analogy, as a, a to use the word fascist. I, have, I don't have that. To me, it's fascist because it's using hatred, specifically racial hatred, ethnic hatred. It's claiming the right of one ethnic group to dominate over others. It is, it is undermining the rule of law and the basic rules of fair play and the way a democracy works. It's misrepresenting facts in a systematic effort to make people no longer 
understand what true, what, how to verify something, how to say something is true. And these are the tactics of, of the Nazis in the 1930s. I don't need to see the stormtroopers start walking down the street yet in order for me to feel comfortable using that camera. Although some people would also say, when you saw the marches in uh, Charlottesville in Virginia a few years ago, that that effect, literally they were taking uh, uh, a play out of the same play. So what do you think? Should we use the term fascism today? Is it appropriate? I think it was. It was. Is it, or? I say, use the word was purposefully because at the uh, during the presidency of Trump, right. it felt more or it felt less like that. There were instances where I said, yes, this is going fascistic. Yes. And there were other areas where it was just lying to his teeth and people spinning fiction and not necessarily doing the type of political manipulations that I would say is fascist. I'm gonna give you two examples that really made my blood curdle as a scholar. One was during the January 6th event, uh, attack on the Congress building. There was next to it, someone had put, had put a, a noose in a tree or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it looked like. But um, that really evoked what, what German historians would refer to as kind of the popular pressure behind Hitler to become, to, to finally get violent and get active. One of the recent changes in scholarship in the last 15 years, and I've been part of this, is that we used to talk about the origins of National Socialism almost exclusively from the perspective of Hitler and the party as if the party was the directing force of genocide. And what um, more recent scholarship has shown is that at crucial moments, Hitler was actually nervous about taking the next step to more violent action. And it was popular pressure from his more radical members that actually pushed him to take the next step. So we now talk about kind of a dynamic between the leader and his followers, each kind of goading the other one on to more radical steps. That's what I saw taking yep. place on January 4th. That was to me the, the um, one of the signs that we were entering into a different place. But and the, the other thing is- But the instigating Trump two months, three months before already saying that there will be this event so here's, so here's how we talk about it in German history, and you can see if it applies. In German history, what we talk about now, the way that the, you know, the recent research is describing it, is that Hitler was a visionary. He put out an idea of what the world could look like. And in my terms, I would say that this world was, he was imagining a rebuilt nation and a German empire. So it's a little confusing because usually we treat nationalism, nation building and empire building as opposites, right? Because after World War I, nations arise and empires decline. Well, in fact, that's not really true at all. Empires expanded. Anyway, so the point is that when we think of the German Reich in the 1930s and the 1940s, on the one hand, they wanted to rebuild their nation in the wake of Treaty of Versailles and uh, all the humiliation since World War I. And that meant getting rid of, within their country, of all people who were different, right? Homogenizing the nation, making all Catholics and Protestants into Aryans and pushing out the Jews and pushing out the Gypsies. Okay. So that, that nation building process, I definitely see at work on the right in the United States. This effort to make America great again, to restore the dominance and the pride and the status of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who ruled the country for the last 200 years, up to Kennedy, right? Um, but then there's the empire building side. <laughs> and that empire building side was a vision from Hitler that Germany needs land and resources. 
and it's going to come at the expense of these other more primitive peoples out there who are just going to disappear. <laughs> the key point is that contemporary scholars now would say that Hitler really didn't have a very coherent plan for how that was going to happen. And in fact, he let his underlings kind of figure it out as they go along. And I really see that. That's where I see the similarity. I don't, you know, Trump, when he, when he, when he makes comments, he kind of just talks off the cuff of what he thinks he feels and what he thinks is going to sell. And people then, and it's that vision. And then it's how it gets implemented by his followers. And you saw this really clearly in the trial of this young man who just the first one who got convicted after the January 6th um, uh, attack. Um, uh, he, he was in New York. I don't know if you're following the trial, but he said, I was just joking <laughs> when I said, we should kill Nancy Pelosi and we should do these things. And in any case, I was just following what he put for. <laughs> See, that was exaggeration. <laughs> that was exaggeration, sorry. I was just following what he suggested. And then you, you even heard voices where people say, Trump can't say the things that he wants to say. And we have to do them for him. So we literally have a phrase for this in German history. It's called working towards the will of the Fuhrer. And the premise is that this international conspiracy is preventing the leader from really implementing the policies that he wants. In the 1930s, it was a Jewish international conspiracy that, that was preventing Hitler from doing what he wants. And therefore, you have to implement it on your own. And a really wonderful scholar named Michael Michel Wilt uh, wrote a wonderful book showing that in the crucial period of 1938 to 1939, just before the Kristallnacht, but after the invasion of Czechoslovakia, Hitler was nervous again. He did he go too far? Is the world going to try to now stop him from, from continuing? And what you see is a wave of popular attacks against Jews in little villages and towns across Central Europe in anticipation, what we call anticipatory violence, trying to push Hitler to take the next step because he's being prevented from doing it. It's very famous in January 1939, Hitler gave a very famous speech where he prophesied the destruction of world Jewry if the Jews forced Germany into a new war. Notice the psychological displacement yeah. that's going on. Um, really, so the, the old version of this, Hitler had a plan to destroy the Jews by 1939. The new interpretation would be Hitler was responding to his own people with a new vision that was even more radical than before. And then the war opens up the possibility. All of a sudden, he invades Poland. He doesn't just have 1% of the Jewish population in his country, 10% of the Jewish population, they're Jews all over the place. Now he can ramp up and the expectations and the possibilities become bigger. He invades both Soviet Union. <laughs> You've got even larger numbers of Jews. The scope of the possible gets bigger. This is a different kind of way of telling the story. There's a way of telling the story where the leader and the people are kind of dynamically working with each other, not like, like shaking hands working with each other, interacting. I think that that's chillingly similar to what's going on today. Okay. Other questions from I, I have one from Sally Reed. I recently read Wounded Knee by Heather Cox Richardson, and the history of 1819 resonates with today. Harrison did not win the popular vote. The Republicans were manipulating the census process and also trying to suppress votes in other in some places. The Gilded Age saw a great disparity in rich versus poor. And from Ed, wait, wait, can we can we deal with that one first? Yeah. yeah because <laughs> so this is the critique of the of the comparison I, I made earlier. <clears throat> American politics has been corrupt for a very long time. Both parties have manipulated the system at different times. And both parties have gerrymandered. Gerrymandering is a democratic invention, after all. Um, we, we 
political machines are an invention of the Democratic Party as well. So we know that um, there have been a lot of times when um, the will of the people has been thwarted. My favorite joke is um, the, the older woman who decides she wants to be buried in Chicago because she wants to stay politically active. <laughs> <laughs> right? because, because they would go to the, they would find the names on, on gravestones and they would vote for them. Like, okay, so, um, so that is an argument in favor of what my colleague was saying, that this is not fascism, that this is just a small elite, an oligarchy in effect trying to manage a democracy and using the veil of democracy, I think the degree to which this has become callous, open, and um, rule-breaking is what's different. And I'm going to here follow uh, the work of Alon Confino. He's a colleague of mine from Israel, wrote a wonderful book. He's the one who wrote this book about Hitler's vision of a world without Jews. Um, I think what we're seeing is the breaking of taboos. It's one thing to manipulate votes behind the scenes. It's another thing to do it publicly in a performative ritual proudly and think that you're gonna get away with it because you're not gonna get prosecuted. And we've seen this former president did not get prosecuted for crimes of treason against the state against this country. So that taboo breaking has a, fu a fundamentally different impact on the democracy because it says that there are no rules left and we can do anything that we want. So I, I really do think that, that there's a, a, a crucial step that's been crossed. Over. Another question? Ed, Ed has one little remark about uh, uh, Lebensraum yes. uh, room. He said, and Trump, buying Greenland for America. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more facetious. Yeah. The other analogy that I, that I find most compelling is, um, is the relationship between what I would call traditional conservatives and Hitler. So in the European world, this is gonna make sense to our European colleagues. When you say a person's a conservative, doesn't mean what a conservative means today in the United States. A conservative meant that you wanted, you were an aristocrat <laughs> and you believed that the old elite of the society should continue ruling. So the House of Lords in England, the, the arist aristocracy, they should, they already dominated for, for the early part of the 20th century. Um, the, realm of, of justice, of bureaucracy, the, the military bureaucracy, the government, the foreign office. So say that you, you were a conservative, it meant that those, the old traditional elites, kings and aristocrats, should continue having political power. A conservative today in the United States is very confused because even just 20 years ago, a conservative meant something radically different. George Will believed in small government, believed in free enterprise, but he also believed that government should have power and government should maintain law and order. In the last four years, we had a president who is so anti-government or at least representing anti-government forces that he undermined the ability of the government even to have authority. He used it purely for his own personal benefits. And, and so um, that kind of conservative is very hard to interpret because it doesn't make sense in the old categories. And I was thinking before I came here <laughs> today, I was thinking about how to phrase this and I figured it out. It's very important to remember, again, I'm speaking to my European colleagues. Um, it's very important to remember that in the United States, the real power always in, is in money and it's not in status or birth. So really what we need to think about is the preservation of the power of moneyed interests, capitalist interests. And then the conservatism makes more sense. But still, if we take the people who are, the, the degree to which many of our politicians are beholden to massive donations from very, very rich people, and we see that they have allied with Trump and his more radical group, 
then we see a structural similarity to the 1930s in Germany. Because what did happen was the old aristocrats very reluctantly came to terms with this upstart populist who used, the old conservatives were anti-Semitic too, but he used it in such a vulgar and public way that it made them the old elites a little uncomfortable. What they didn't realize is that very soon that alliance fell apart. So by 1935, Hitler kills some of the leaders of the old conservatives and wins over the rest of them in, in a, in, during the light of, night of long nights. Long story short, the collusion between established interests and the new populist right is the point that I'm trying to draw as a comparison. And that I think we see. The difference is they're being more clever about it this time. They're being very careful and they're keeping groups together. How many of you yes. have been paying attention to the news in the last month about what Liz Cheney has been doing? Hi. Anyone, anyone want to summarize? She, she's a Republican. She's not a moderate. <laughs> extremely conservative. Extremely conservative. She supported Trump for most of the four years. But now in the last month, she has been outspoken saying we, the Republican Party, have to move away from Trump and go back to the more traditional American conservative values. Free markets, more government, rule of law, not, not attacking government, right? I uh, disagreeing with government, reducing it, but not creating a uh, undermining the functionality of government. And uh, what she's getting, she's she's a lone voice within. There's another group that's been trying to do this. The Lincoln, the Lincoln Republicans, I think they're called Lincoln Project. Yeah, the Lincoln Project. Right, trying to separate. So we, this is the kind of dynamic that was taking place in the 1930s in the question of. How close, or the 1920s, depending on how you want to time it, how close will the old elite go get in bed with this new group? Yeah, it's their problems. Okay, uh, we're running past two hours. We have more than an hour of uh, our Zoom meeting here. Uh, I think it's about the time to say, okay, let people go on with their daily. Activity. Thank you. Was that helpful or interesting? Yeah. I hope. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. thank you.